ever feel like, you know, sometimes you're living in the middle of a history book? Well, get ready, because today we're diving into the life of Xenophon. This ancient Greek, he didn't just live history, he practically wrote the book on it. Adventure, leadership, philosophy, you name it, this guy Xenophon was there. And the best part, we're not just getting some dry, dusty account, we're talking first-hand experiences, straight from the source. Soldier, historian, philosopher, all in one Xenophon was the real deal. Okay, you've definitely got my attention. So we're talking ancient Greece, right? Around 400 BCE. Set the scene for us. Who is Xenophon? All right, so picture this. Athens, birthplace of democracy. They've just lost this massive war. We're talking a total shakeup of the ancient world. That's the world Xenophon's born into, right around 430 BCE. Wow, talk about a historical backdrop. And this wasn't just a minor conflict, right? This was the Peloponnesian War, Athens versus Sparta, the Clash of the Titans. How did that loss, that huge event, how did it shape him? It's huge, right? Imagine seeing your whole world kind of turned upside down, everything you thought you knew questioned. The golden age of Athens, over, shattered. It deeply impacted Xenophon's worldview, no doubt. It really sets the stage for his own incredible journey. So how does a guy go from witnessing this epic collapse to, well, becoming a legend himself? How does that even happen? Well, it starts with exile. Imagine being kicked out of your own city, banished. That's Xenophon's reality. Ouch, that's rough. I guess they didn't have frequent flyer miles back then. But seriously, what led to that? Why was he exiled? You know, the exact reasons are still a bit of a mystery. It was probably tied to the ever-shifting political landscape after the war, lots of finger-pointing, you know how it goes. But the point is, exile forced Xenophon to kind of reinvent himself, and that's how he ends up joining this mercenary army led by Cyrus the Younger. Hold on, mercenaries. We're talking ancient Greek soldiers for hire, right? Yeah. So not your average weekend warriors. Definitely not. These were the elite hardened professionals, often hired out by foreign powers because, let's face it, the Greeks knew how to wage war. And Cyrus, he wasn't just some random prince either. He was aiming to overthrow his own brother, King Artaxerxes II, the king of Persia. Whoa, wait a minute. Okay, so we've got Xenophon, exiled Athenian, joins up with a band of mercenaries fighting for a rebellious prince against not just any king, but his own brother, who also happens to be the ruler of a massive empire. Did I get all that? This is already an epic movie waiting to happen. You got it. And believe it or not, this is where things get even wilder. Xenophon and these 10,000 soldiers, they set out on what we now call the March of the 10,000. The March of the 10,000. That has a, uh, a certain ring to it. Sounds intense. Oh, it was. Imagine, just imagine trekking over a thousand miles on foot through enemy territory with, you know, limited supplies and all that, all to put a new king on the throne. On foot. No GPS, no energy bars, no podcasts to pass the time. Man, I can barely make it through airport security without needing a snack break. That's insane. Yeah. This is where we really start to see what Xenophon was made of, right? Absolutely. This wasn't just about, you know, physical endurance. This was a crash course in leadership, in strategy, in understanding cultures completely different from your own. And thankfully for us, Xenophon, he documented it all in his book, Anabasis. Anabasis, man, it's like, I don't know, Game of Thrones meets Survivorman, Ancient Greece edition. And this guy, Xenophon, he doesn't just survive it, he writes the book on it, literally. Okay, I'm sensing a theme here. Right, remember how we were talking about Xenophon being like fascinated by leadership, even in the middle of exile on this crazy march? It's always on his mind, and it comes through big time in his other works too. You mean Cyropedia? Okay. I've heard of this one. It's about Cyrus the Great, right? <laughs> the Persian king. That's the one. And this is where things get really interesting, especially if you're into leadership, history, or frankly, just a good story. So, Xenophon writes this whole book about Cyrus, the founder of the Persian Empire. The same empire, by the way, that he was fighting against earlier. Kind of ironic, right? Wait, seriously. So it's like he's saying, Dear Diary, today I learned about leadership from my former enemy. That's wild. What's the deal with that? See, that's what makes Xenophon so fascinating. Scholars are still debating whether he intended Cyropedia as straight history, you know, a biography, or more like a philosophical treatise. Was he using Cyrus as an example, a model to get his own ideas about leadership across? So maybe it's like a, a leadership manual disguised as a biography. Sneak in some wisdom while you're telling a good story. Pretty clever. Exactly. And the wisdom he's packing is timeless. I mean, it's still relevant today. Xenophon uses Cyrus's story, whether it's entirely accurate or, you know, maybe a little embellished, to highlight what makes a truly great leader. We're talking about things like virtue, wisdom, justice, the ability to inspire, to unite people from all different backgrounds. 
Man, those themes, they never get old, do they? Especially these days. It's like maybe Xenophon was onto something about finding common ground, even with people you might consider, I don't know, your rivals, your opponents. That's what's so insightful about Xenophon. He wasn't just about winning battles, right? He was thinking about the bigger picture. How do you build a just society, a society that flourishes? And for him, it all came back to leadership, leadership rooted in strong values. Okay, I'm starting to see why people are still reading this guy after, what, over 2,000 years? Uh. Speaking of influential figures, we can't talk about Xenophon without mentioning Socrates, can we? <laughs> Wasn't he like tight with the OG of philosophy? Oh, absolutely. He was a student of Socrates, a devoted follower, and luckily for us, he wrote about their time together in memorabilia. It's like getting a front row seat to history's greatest philosophy lectures. Sign me up. I always wished I could time travel back to those ancient Greek symposiums, soak up some of that wisdom firsthand. So what's memorabilia like? Is it similar to what we see in Plato's dialogues? Well, that's the cool thing. Xenophon, he gives us this whole other angle on Socrates. You know how in Plato's writings, Socrates is often this, I don't know, almost mystical figure debating these really abstract ideas. Right, head in the clouds kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. But Xenophon Socrates, he's a bit more grounded, more relatable. Don't get me wrong, he's still concerned with ethics and virtue and all that, but he's also very much engaged with everyday life, with practical matters. I like getting different perspectives on the same person, right? Um, like reading a biography versus listening to stories from their friends. So what's Xenophon Socrates like, personality-wise? He comes across as very practical, very focused on how you actually live a good life, how you apply wisdom to real everyday challenges. Less about high-minded theories, more about how to be a better friend, a better citizen, a better human being, you know? Yeah, totally. It's like they say, the more things change. Yeah. But anyway, it sounds like we've only scratched the surface of Xenophon's writing. The guy was prolific. He really was. And you can see his personality shine through even beyond war and philosophy, you know? We talked about Xenophon the soldier, the historian, the philosopher, but he was also like a Renaissance man way ahead of his time. Okay, now you have to elaborate on that. What else did he write about? Spill the beans. Well, remember how we were talking about his practical side? Yeah, that comes through in everything he wrote. Like, he's got these works on horsemanship, which makes sense, right? Given his whole cavalry background. Right. You don't lead the March of the 10,000 without picking up a thing or two about horses. Exactly. But it doesn't stop there. We're talking hunting, managing estates, economics, even, get this, Athenian politics. Exiled from Athens, sure, but still writing about how they should be running things. He's talking about dedication. So like he was creating a, like the original self-help library, ancient Greek style. Mm -hmm. What ties it all together though? I mean, what's the common thread running through all these different works? That's a great question. Throughout all his writing, you see this emphasis on practical wisdom, on living a virtuous life, on understanding what makes for effective leadership. These are things that honestly, they don't go out of style. It makes you wonder why he kind of faded into obscurity for a while. You'd think someone that insightful, that timeless would always be in fashion. You're right. His popularity has had its ups and downs. I mean, for centuries after his death, he was huge E.E. -E. Roman emperors were reading him, looking for advice, for guidance. Talk about influence. Yeah. So what happened? Did ancient Rome discover TikTok and everyone forgot about good old Xenophon? Not quite, but yeah, tastes change. By the 1800s, his writing, which is very straightforward, you know, is considered a little too simple, maybe even a little boring compared to some of the more complex Greek writers. And some scholars, they even started to question like his accuracy as a historian. So he got put on the back burner for a bit. Pretty much. But here's the thing about good ideas, they tend to come back around. And sure enough, in the 20th and 21st centuries, we've seen a resurgence of interest in Xenophon and his work. That's great. Why the comeback? what sparked this Xenophon renaissance? Well, for one thing, historians were taking a fresh look at the periods he wrote about. Times of massive upheaval, uncertainty, you know, kind of like our world today. So his writing about navigating chaos, about mm -hmm. finding your way when everything's changing around you, it kind of strikes a chord with modern readers. Bingo. Plus, there's this growing appreciation for his unique voice. Down to earth, practical, relatable. It's a side of ancient Greece we don't always get to see. It's like he's bridging that gap between their world and ours, you know? So as we wrap up this deep dive into the world of Xenophon, what's the one big takeaway you'd want our listeners to remember? What's the elevator pitch for Xenophon? 
I think he'd want us to remember that history isn't just, you know, dates and names and stuff you memorize in school. It's about learning from the experiences, the good and the bad, of the people who came before us. And hopefully, understanding their world a little better helps us understand our own a little better, too. Well said. It's like they say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And Xenophon's life and his writing, they really embody that. It's been amazing getting this glimpse into ancient Greece through his eyes. Big thanks to you, our expert, for taking us on this journey. My pleasure. And to all our listeners, thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive. We'll see you next time when we plunge into another well, fascinating chapter. Like a metronome, life ain't no paradise. Women dusting catacombs, mind steel clad, heart calm amidst the cyclone. Strength in the stillness where my scars as a keystone. Stoic sword slice through chaos, never once deterred. Struggle forced to iron will, silence is preferred. Pillars patience, wisdom's echo never slurred. Battlegrounds rage and virtues blaze undisturbed. Vice is tempted, whispers in the midnight. Virtue's lantern, cutting through the dark night. Battle rages, yet I'm standing on the zen height stoic vision crystal clear guiding through the fight running through the gauntlet fire in my veins burn painted teacher lessons edged pages that we turn fortress of the mind no retreat no concern virtue steady beacon storms i discern running through the gauntlet fire in my veins burn painted teacher lessons edged pages that we turn fortress of the mind no retreat no concern virtue steady beacon storms i discern Against the current, standing tall, never bent World spins frantic, I refuse to relent Timeless wisdom flows every single event Stoic calm, unyielding, life's true testament Weight of a thousand trials, break chains ascend Mind over matter, wounds men start again Clarity and silence, where's the anger transcend Stoic path, unshaken doing the what I feel, my mama said trying is failing There is no ifs, woulds, coulds, shoulds It just is, and we just are. I would say ask her out. No matter who she is, whether she's a job or a new city, an opportunity or a fear or an actual person, whatever she is, man, ask her out. Go out there and make something of yourself for God's sake. Be an honest person and work and get to the top of whatever it is that you want to get to the top of. Stand up for yourself like a respectable human being and be a bit of a light on the world instead of a blight. That might make life worth living. It's like, yeah, it might. So why don't you go do it? The time is now. The time is now to express and for people to believe in themselves. The time is now for it to be okay to be great. People in this world shun people for being great, for being a bright color, for standing out. But the time is now to be okay to be the greatest you. You and I are capable of doing whatever we can see. We can hold it in our head, we can hold it in our hand. Don't waste your life. Set your goals high. Quit thinking about what's wrong. Start thinking what's right. Love a little more, hate a little less. You have no idea what you're capable of doing. Make up your mind today, you're going to figure it out. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and you're your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. But life, that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. Is to shake off this... Uh, this uh, Life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. It is good to be generous, benign, and magnanimous, but there's a limit, or you'll be taken for granted. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender or submission. John F. Kennedy Don't tell your friends that you're happy. Don't make them angry. Don't tell your enemies that you're unhappy. Don't make them happy. What stands in the way becomes the way.
The most precious gift we can offer anyone is our attention. When mindfulness embraces those we love, they will bloom like flowers. Thich Nhat Hanh. Well, come back. I got comeback power. It's no time to be casual. It's time to be on fire. It's time to increase your energy and your drive and your passion to win. See, at some point in time, all of us have seen our destiny. I was six years old, a man by the name of Reverend Ed Graham, a Mount Zion Baptist Church in Miami. I was six years old right before Christmas. My mother was ill. We had no food in the house. And this tall, strapping man around 6'1 came to the door with a food basket in his hand. And he says, hello, is this the Brown family? My mother said, yes. I understand that you have two sons and a daughter. And that you have no food. Yes, I'm from Mount Zion Baptist Church. And around Christmas time, we pass out food baskets to needy family. Take the basket in behalf of the church and have a nice Christmas. And when he walked out, I said, oh, boy, I'd like to be like that man. And I went to his church and I used to watch him speak and tall and powerful and dynamic speaker. Such eloquence. One of his favorite people was the poet Kipling who wrote, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. A friend of mine, Mildred Singleton, well, she was on a school outing and, and they took her to a hospital and she was in the operating room watching from a distance and she saw someone working or doing eye surgery and she says, that's what I want to do. She's just a teenager and today she's an ophthalmologist. All of us have seen our destiny at some point in time and we decided not to listen. We decided to ignore it and say, no, that's, that's not for me. Life came in and slapped us side the head and we stopped dreaming anymore. The impulse to dream has been slowly beaten out of me through the experience of life. And that's what causes many of us to give up on our volcano. The experiences and the challenges, the defeats, the disappointments and the failures of life. Then we decide to sell out on our true potential, sell out on living our dreams feeling that we're not good enough, not wanting to make any mistakes, particularly if you're raised with a great deal of criticism. So you've got to be willing. What? Are either Panthea or Pergamus abiding to this day by their master's tombs? Or either Chabrias or Diotimus by that of Adrianus? Oh, foolery! For what if they did? Would their masters be sensible of it? Or if sensible, would they be glad of it? Or if glad were these immortal? Was not it appointed unto them also, both men and women? to become old in time, and then to die? And these once dead, what would become of these former? And when all is done, what is all this for, but for a mere bag of blood and corruption? Hard times may have held you down, but they will not last forever. Don't get bogged down in regrets. No one is perfect. To live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist, that is all. Oscar Wilde Never sacrifice these three things, your family, your heart, or your dignity. They are not dead who live in the hearts they leave behind. Let go of the idea of who you think you should be and embrace who you truly are. Muji They just have enough energy to complain about it, and they consider that, in fact, they believe that that's equivalent to doing something about it, just complaining. No, that can't get you where you want to go. That cannot create your reality for you. The other thing that keeps most people from realizing their true greatness and their true potential, circumstances, their environment. There are many people who believe because of where they're born, because of the area where they are in life and where they find themselves, that's all they know. Given my circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. See, I know something about you, even not knowing you, that you've got greatness within you. You have the ability to do things that you can't even begin to imagine. You have talents and skills in you that you haven't even begun to reach for yet. No one could have convinced me, given my circumstances, given my background, that I would be doing what I'm doing right now. I was born in Liberty City on a floor on 62nd Street, my twin brother and me. 
When we were six weeks of age, we were adopted. When I was in fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled educable mentally retarded, and put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I have no college training, but here's what happened. I had an intervention in my life. A man who saw something in me in a time that I did not see something in myself. I never forget being in his class one day waiting on a friend of mine who was there to rehearse for a play. He did not show up and he asked me to go up to the board and write something on the board. And I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, I, well, I'm, I'm in a special education class. He said, what do you mean? Go up to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. I said, I can't do that, sir. Why not? I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk. He said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that changed my life. It was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said that once a person's mind is... Of all the means which wisdom acquires to ensure happiness throughout the whole of life, by far the most important is friendship. It's easy to say you want something, but it's hard to actually make it happen. It is our attitude toward events, not events themselves, which we can control. Nothing is by its own nature calamitous. Even death is terrible only if we fear it. One word frees us of all the weight and pain of life. That word is love. Sophocles. There is time for everything.